I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. I think this is our fourth SIG uh, for Linux Hit Security Special Interest Group. We're really excited to get going today. Uh, we're in for a treat. We have Nathan uh, on the line who wants to share what he's been working on uh, on automatic privilege separation in this project called Memorizer, and he'll get into that. Uh, before we deep dive into that, I just want to open the floor. If there are any new faces or folks on the call who would like to just say hello and introduce themselves. Uh, I see a lot of a lot of familiar names in the list, but if anyone wants to join uh, and just say hello or give a wave, you have the floor. Hi, everyone. Not a new face, but a new voice. Um, I'm Adam Bates. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois. Uh, I'm here because uh, I'm doing a little bit of uh, Docker research, and Nathan invited me along for his, uh, to listen to his uh, little talk today. Awesome. Hi, my name is Imani Palmer. I'm a PhD student at the University of Illinois, and I've just been working with Nathan on a lot of this work over the past year. So I'm also here to find out more and to see how this works with Docker. Anyone else? We move on. All right. Uh, just some quick administrative before we jump into the deep dive. We meet every two weeks, so our next meeting will be July 19th. It's a Wednesday. Uh, this is an open invitation public group, so if you have any friends or colleagues who you think might be interested in discussing uh, Linux kits, Docker, upstream Linux security, uh, generally, uh, please invite them. Uh, we also have a Mobi project forum where we uh, invite discussion as well as on our Slack channel on the Docker community Slack. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll hand it off to Nathan, who's going to be talking to us today about automatic privilege, privilege separation and as well as deep diving into a memorizer. So Nathan, maybe leave my mouse so I can get off the screen sharing. And hopefully this should work for you. Excellent. Thanks, Raz. Yeah. Um, okay. So start sharing here. Well, thank you all for uh, having me. I'm very excited to um, be presenting on the uh, memorizer and kind of OPS work. And uh, I'm going to just give a brief kind of description of some of the context with which memorizer is occurring within. Um, I think that there might be a lot of uh, kind of touch points for the folks in this community. So, and then I'm going to describe the, the OPS as opportunistic purpose separation. So it's kind of the meta project. Um, and then dive into the uh, code and, and kind of results of Memorizer. So, uh, and uh, please ask questions as we go through. I um, want to make sure that uh, relaying information and, and, you know, anything that's interesting, please go ahead and hack on here. Okay, so... We, we want awesome, scalable, lightweight multi-tenancy. We want to be able to use existing infrastructure. And Docker is you know, really pushing the envelope in this regard. But there's this kind of big question about uh, security. And the biggest issue is, is that our trusted computing base is very large. It's comprised of you know, a million lines of code. And it really is very similar to a modern-day Titanic you know, this, this amazing <clears throat> infrastructure, but which is kind of highly susceptible to threat. And uh, once it's exploited, basically leads to instant sync shipping. Um, basically, this is the case because of a couple reasons. Um, you have lots of layers of vulnerable code, um, which is basically written by a lot of people and far too many people to vet. So if you think about the Linux kernel, you have um, in one commit, you know, one release alone, over 2,000 different developers c contributing, uh, 5,000 plus in its lifespan. You have things like Firefox and all kinds of layers that you're, that you're you know, trusting code. Um, and it's really unvettable. Uh, you have a lot of it, so it's basically Titanic. Uh, and it's also monolithic, which is kind of the worst piece. Um, and this is, you know, really what uh, motivates things like SC Linux and all these other pieces is that 
you have a default in, uh, default environment where basically anything in the, this TCB has full access to everything. And so we want to actually do restrictions on that environment uh, to improve the security. And then the last kind of element here is it's, um, you know, Docker is really changing how we deploy and use uh, resources and our infrastructure. And it's, you know, from my perspective, it's not really clear how Docker impacts this, the security ecosystem. You know, in some ways it makes it more secure because it, you know, uh, abstracts away things and can restrict and, and, and contain things. But in other ways, you know, in, in particular in the multi-tenancy environment, it's not clear what impacts or implications are there because of Docker. Um, so these are kind of the open questions that I hope to kind of address or explore. So the standard kind of approaches uh, are to replace or harden and separate. So we could replace it with a type safe language or microkernel design, which would be great. There's been a lot of approaches and a lot of attempts, but there's over 3 billion devices that are using monolithic systems. Um, and so we really want to make sure we can protect these things in place, which gives us the hardening and separating kind of focus. And I use the Titanic metaphor because it, it both reflects the, the nature of the problem, but it also reflects kind of an idea of, of how to go about solving it. So hardening is, you know, making the external shell more resistant to attack and uh, separation is, is kind of taking the inside and compartmentalizing so that any one kind of penetration has minimal impact or can, can be kind of get resiliency with respect to those attacks. Um, the, you know, the, the general principle is that we want to minimize privileges so that once, you know, if an attack happens or if an, a unit or component is faulty, uh, or, uh, malicious by default, then it can only do so much damage. Um, and, and this is kind of where I see tools like SE Linux, Landlock. Um, these are existing approaches that do a great job of minimizing app privileges and, and thus greatly enhancing the security of the system. And so uh, just a, a note on how I've kind of tried to organize the presentation is I'm tr I've tried to um, kind of tie everything as much as possible into the, the, the aspects of Docker security that are most relevant to the work. Um, and I, I did a little bit of review on Landlock and SE Linux. I'm not an expert by any means. So I'm gonna hopefully use some meta, you know, kind of relate it to these things. My, my relationships might be off, so please let me know if, if they're incorrect. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, though, my assumptions and kind of what I've explored already are true. Okay, so, um, so you know, these are effective, um, you know, uh, techniques that harden and separate uh, the system to get more security. Uh, there is a big problem, though, with these approaches in that they, you, you assume by default everything is accessible. And then you bolt on prop policies after the fact. So what happens is that you really only get protection for things that you know are problematic and for sensitive things that are issues. And, and that, um, I think, leaves this, the security situation where you have a lot of vulnerabilities. And, and, and for, uh, as a concrete example, you know, the whole uh, OS resource virtualization technique is great, but the things that aren't virtualized are basically opportunities for potential kind of backdoors or, or threats. So for example, the UID namespacing uh, types of things. Um, and so kind of my intuition is, is, can we flip the script and say, by default, things are protected in some meaningful way, and then we whitelist. Um, but that's kind of one of the kind of core things that this research or, you know, my work uh, ceased to kind of start addressing. So the, the major goal or the major questions that kind of the OPS and Memorizer and the, the stuff I'm, I've been exploring uh, deal with, um, sorry. Uh, sorry, Nathan, didn't realize you had Slack up, disregard. Yeah, yeah I apologize. For later. I thought it might be <laughs> that I was telling me something about the presentation. <laughs> uh, so we can, we can solve that right here. Slack's gone. Okay. Um, so um, the, the idea that, you know, kind of the, the, the meta picture, the meta questions that this work seeks to address is, number one, what are the threats? So I think, you know, Adam and I have been talking a lot about Docker, and I've actually been thinking about Docker for the past couple of years and finally getting into it. 
you know, really understanding how it impacts the security ecosystem. So you want to, you know, uh, kind of a systematic way of uh, assessing threats or understanding the ecosystem. And then, you know, the, the bigger, the more, more kind of specific focus of mine is to, you know, retrofit security into the system and it'd be efficient and all these other things. Um, and, but there's, you know, along these lines, there's a couple of limitations. So I'm, I'm drawing these limitations because they kind of etch out where the tools and techniques that we present here may be useful um, in the environment. So uh, things like SE Linux or um, even Landlock, uh, they, they're going to rely on developer expertise. So you, it, de it demands a, a, a very strong understanding of things that you want to protect, uh, the language with which to specify those protections, and then it requires a lot of not just domain expertise, but also security expertise and really thinking about how does information flow, um, which, is, which makes it really challenging to apply systematically. Um, another thing that existing uh, kind of approaches lack is visibility into applications themselves. And again, I'm just starting to learn about, about SE Linux and these techniques, so I, I may not have a full understanding, but what, what you lack is, you know, kind of intra-application or intra-address space awareness. So, for example, you know, you have file descriptors and sockets and these types of things, and you're specifying policies based upon processes, but what happens inside of that process? Uh, is there, you know, other ways for information to leak out or be corrupted or these, these types of things? And so there's really uh, no fine grain or intra-application visibility. Uh, they typically only protect like known safety critical resources. So you have to explicitly say, hey, this is an important thing. We want to protect it. Um, uh, they, they, they require manual policy derivation. So it kinda, I kind of hit, hit on that with respect to developer expertise. Um, but basically, uh, deriving policies is really hard. Um, in fact, there's been a couple of really, uh, you know, popular people like Butler Lamson has come out and said, you know, security policy is is, is impossible um, and it to, to do it really really tightly um, and in you know by the people that are actually applying it so that's really challenging um, the existing abstractions as I've as I've kind of started thinking about them are seem very hard-coded and coarse coarse grained so um, the you know basically if you want to specify a policy, it's done at these abstractions like file systems or files or networks, uh, these types of things. And they're not, not really extensible. Uh, you have to basically add it, do a lot of work to extend the system to capture new abstractions. Um, they also don't, from what I can tell, uh, capture ephemeral state. So, so most of the SE Linux type policies appear to be very focused on um, kind of persistent state. Um, but a lot of security happens at runtime um, and, and, and basically can leak things out through channels that, that are not observable uh, through those persistent or kind of existing abstractions. Um, and then lastly, or maybe not lastly, but uh, another aspect is that they don't really address kernel principles. So my work is really focusing on how to harden, uh, you know, commodity operating system. So I'm really zooming in there. Uh, the techniques I present are more general, and that's where I kind of will overlay in this presentation. But they, uh, there's no really strong kernel principle abstractions. Um, and then the last thing, which is what I'm, I'm not really sure of fully, but it seems like existing technologies are not really container aware. Um, and so sending them in the kernel for that might be very, uh, have a lot of effort. Um, and, and if you want to comment on these, I'm, 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 uh, I would love to understand if these, these limitations are full and complete. Like I said, I'm just kind of entering into the, for entering into this, the SE Linux or these types of protections. So, okay. Um, so these somewhat lay out the challenges, um, for what, what this work is seeking to do. Um, and I'm going to just kind of present a couple of these at a high level. So the challenges that, that we're addressing is, you know, what are the abstractions? How do you abstract and specify policies? I mentioned some of the, the kind of what I would call um, kind of hard-coded abstractions and policies. Um, and can we get things that are more extensible? Uh, 
Another, the second thing is, you know, flexible scale with systematic policy derivation. So how do we derive policies that we, that are systematically applied regardless of expertise? So what are the principles, objects, and operations? Um, how do you get them as non-expert? And then how do you protect all resources? So, you know, can we, can we identify policies without really needing to know which, which things are important and which things are not important and, and provide this minimization of privilege without all that expertise? expertise uh, and labeling effectively. Um, then we have a set of issues with respect to transforming the system. So if you have a suitable policy and abstractions, how do you modify the system to actually do that? And there's a whole set of challenges in that. For example, you know, from what I can tell, SE Linux was a great piece of work. It hooks into the kernel, but it's a, a tremendous maintenance burden because you, know, you have all these hooks. And then if you extend them, you basically have to go in and fine tune all of the the, the, the enforcement mechanisms. And so can we do this kind of, you know, in, in more efficient ways from the, from the maintenance and the, you know, implementation side of things? Uh, how do you efficiently protect you know, these things? The model will, will, the policy will give you new, you know, restrictions, but how much does it cost? Uh, whenever you're starting to retrofit protections or reduce privileges, you have the potential for incompatibilities. So you have to kind of uh, have a set of questions about those issues. And then the last piece here is evolution. So, and I kind of hinted on this already, as the, the core system evolves, as the policies evolve and the privileges demand, uh, you know, the use cases demand different privileges, you know, how easy is it to capture these and modify the protection system and policy uh, accordingly? So uh, a quick overview of the set of projects that, that we've got, um, just to kind of say we've got them, I'm not gonna detail them, but uh, I, there might be overlap with you know, others' interests or so forth, so just to mention them. So I'm gonna be kind of talking about OPS, which is the, an end-to-end -end approach for fine-grained security policy retrofitting, and really focusing on the derivation of privileges uh, piece. Uh, we have, uh, so my thesis work was on this new operating system architecture called the nested kernel, um, we're building a prototype in Linux, uh, we're calling it Lynx, and this, this is actually really similar to the O-Kernel project, I, I don't know if people are aware of this, but um, where O-Kernel is starting to implement uh, separation, inter-kernel separations, um, and so it's, it's actually a very similar project to that. There is also, um, we've got a, uh, a framework that works for fine-grained kernel randomization, and KREX implements uh, non-readable memory. And what that means is it, it's basically a lightweight approach to, to kind of defend against gadget-based attacks using randomization. So uh, using code randomization so people can actually read the code and therefore get gadgets. Um, we have Memorizer, which I'll be talking about today. It's a tool that actually traces um, interactions. And then Slice, um, which is a, a system that we're building to explore the privilege separation of OPS. So OPS is going to give us a set of policies, um, a set of protection, I, uh, separation, uh, compartmentalizations, and then slices this thing that's actually going to do it and do it efficiently and all those other pieces. Um, okay. So uh, any, any questions or comments right now uh, before I go on? I know I went through a lot of stuff, just wanting to characterize the environment or the kind of the motivation of the work. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, and I know it's fairly abstract. So hopefully, we'll, we'll slowly get more uh, more specific and concrete. So, opportunistic privilege separation. So, the major question that 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 I'm that I'm asking is: Okay, we've got we we want we know we want to apply least privilege. We want to minimize privileges so we can restrict you know uh, applications and, and interactions in the system. But the question is: Is how do we actually get the policies for them? Um, and the, the core hypothesis of OPS is that we can automatically derive privileges from system behavior. So, and, and, and it kind of intuition, an intuition on how this works is, you know, um, you know, the kernel Linux is very robust and because of, and, and typically robustness is a byproduct of modularity. And so the hypothesis is that the existing kind of, you know, good programming practices and techniques will result in reasonable, um, easily extractable separation policies. 
And the goal here is to, to, to mine the existing behavior and, and, and as if they were basically capabilities themselves. So make an assumption that there's no bad guys in the, in the base system. And then we will we'll have some analysis technique that extracts the, 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 the required permissions for things in the system. And then those will set up an initial like uh, policy, separation policy. And the, the high level idea is that we wanna build a tool suite similar to an optimizing compiler, right? So we wanna basically create a representation for privileges and interactions in the system. And we want to then combine that with efficient, um, in, in a set of analysis techniques that allow us to identify um, separation or compartmentalization uh, opportunities. And then from there, we, we translate into that, the efficient enforcement and controlled sharing piece, the slice piece that, uh, that we've got. Um, and this requires, as I said, a privilege model. So what, what, you know, what is the representation of privileges? And then uh, obviously the, the goal is that we're gonna approximate these privileges, strong fail safe defaults. So, We want a very simple yet expressive and extensible policy. So uh, our language. So the, like I said already, SE Linux is very powerful, but it presents a set of hard-coded abstractions. And, and, and what, what the OPS model tries to do is not replace SE Linux, but rather um, we want to create a, a, an abstraction or model that is easy to capture things like SE Linux. So basically we want a low level representation that allows us to very easily trace and record things and just kind of get data uh, and, and to analyze. And then on top of that build um, kind of uh, relationships to other models like SE Linux or hopefully something like Landlock, which I don't really understand. But the idea is that we would create a really simple low level abstraction that then can be overlaid or connected to um, different security mechanisms that for protection. Um, uh, also, we wanted to, I, I, really, I really think ephemeral state for intra-kernel fine-grain kind of operations and separation is really important. So, so um, and then uh, another thing we want to do is minimize the human in the loop <clears throat> so that it's, you know, easy, easy to to apply without expertise. So that the model is kind of all built for this particular uh, use. Okay, um, so I wanted to give a, a quick intuition on, um, sorry. a quick intuition on, on the model of what we're trying to, or kind of what we want. So, um, so you can imagine you have an environment and within this environment, you have several things. You have a lot of objects um, and, and an object here I'm using very generally. Um, so I'm trying to be pretty high level about that. Um, and so you could assume that you're so in like something like the Linux kernel and within the kernel, there's things like file descriptors, sockets, all these other things. And what we want to do is we want to say, okay, what's a really valid way of getting separation? Well, one valid way of separation is to break things up based upon the module they, they, they operate within. So for example, you have a crypto module, you have an SE Linux module. Uh, um, and, and by module, I'm not meaning a kernel module, I'm just meaning a component. Uh, so you have, you have different components in the system, right? And you might want to say that, hey, this set of objects right here, are, are, you know, kind of a crypto set of objects. And, you know, this set of objects here is our SE Linux one. And, you know, maybe something over here manages the namespaces and you have a, a scheduler as well. Um, and so you, you go in and you want, you can say, okay, we have all these things in the kernel and there's actually no separation between them right now. And one way of kind of Separating this is to kind of assign uh, boundaries to c components. Um, and, then, and then what you want to do is you want to be able to kind of interpose on these cross 
module interactions. Okay, um, so that's one kind of way of separating. Uh, however, as I mentioned, I, we're really shooting for an extensible separation model. And by that, there might be other ways of separating the kernel or separating an environment. So another way we could separate things is um, based upon the thread ID or the process, which is, I think, typically how SE Linux will do things, right? So in that case, we might have a set of objects that are, you know, accessible to and related to some process or a group of processes. But you, you end up getting a different cut through the system based upon uh, a different kind of privileged con uh, context. So this, this kind of gives you kind of two, two different ways of cutting the system in into different components or, or uh, compartments. Um, another uh, kind of important one relative to, to this conversation, and one that I hope to get some information, I haven't explored it very much, but it is namespaces, right? So if, if data is associated with particular namespaces, then that data, uh, maybe a clean and good boundary is the existing namespace. Um, so, you know, this might put another type of cut on the way we do things. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the whole idea is that wherever you, you, define, you define boundaries based upon some type of program state, code locations, namespace IDs, uh, applications, processes, thread IDs. Um, it, it basically can be anything. And because we're wanting to opportunistically mine privileges, you know, we would like to hopefully, you know, eventually try and figure out what state is very useful that provides good comp decomposition with minimal performance impact. So this is kind of a, a high level intuition of the approach. Um, and now making a little more concrete. So any, any questions? Okay. Um, so, um, so those are just some, so that's the, in, the intuition of how we want to separate things. So how do we actually get this? So we create a unified low level representation and this is really what Memorizer is, is implementing. And basically you treat everything as an object. So basically objects are uh, the storage abstraction and it's just a set of contiguous bytes in memory. So it's a very low level um, kind of virtual address space. So if in this, in this, under this definition, code is an object, right? So a function that begins at some virtual address um, and ends at some other virtual address is considered an ob object. And data file descriptors. But the important piece is to note that this level of abstraction is what all kind of existing security is built on top of. So a file descriptor, you know, or, or kind of an abstract resource at the SE Linux level breaks down into multiple uh, low-level uh, object representations. Um, so there are a set of object operations that we define. There are create and destroy. And so this is basically, you know, allocation and freeing. So kmalloc, and cache alloc, and then the free, particular free things. There are read and write. So you're accessing or modifying uh, a particular object. And then there's execution. So calls and returns. Uh, for the types of objects that we're tracking. Set of objects and the operations that we track with respect to them and the, the basic data abstraction that, that Memorizer uses. So objects also have an, an implicit type that is effectively given by the allocation site and its size. So for example, task struct is allocated in fork and uh, it's, it, it typically is allocated from a KMM cache object, but you can uniquely see the type um, based upon where its location is in, in, the, in the system. And the benefit kind of of this, this really low level representation is that it's, it's, it's simple. We can trace it, we can, we can track it, um, but I think it's, it's and, and this is kind of what we're openly exploring, is, is that it can capture really nice high-level abstractions or, or policies that you may want to build on top of. Um, so the hope is that we could, you know, use this uh, and this set of data to inform SE Linux policies or, 
or even, you know, some of the landlocked stuff. Uh, I'm not sure yet how it would happen, but I, you know, as you're thinking or seeing this presentation, if, um, consider how this low level kind of tracing might inform those types of things. Hey, okay, Nathan, just, uh, just, a question about what, yeah, just a question about what you just mentioned. Um, uh, K Mintash, uh seems to fold together allocations of a similar size. So if you have uh, two different KMM caches for uh, two different structs and different subsystems, but they happen to be the same size or uh, a similar size even, it seems like Linux will actually fold these into one KMM cache and just increase the reference count. Uh, I'm wondering how you track this. Um, so if it's, if it's folding it in, Like for example, uh, K malloc even, and just like the generic allocator. Yeah, it's built on top of K cache underneath that uses like there's a 128 byte K mem cache, 256 byte K mem cache, etc. For yeah, um, yeah. You know, but then for other more specific K mem caches, um, they'll get folded together if the sizes are close enough. Yes, yes, yes. A gr uh, very good question. So, so we don't this the abstraction actually sits underneath K mem cache. Um, ah, okay. Meaning, meaning that um, it, we're not, we don't care about the cache. All we're, all we're tracing is I got an allocation from location virtual address blah, and the size was blah. And we, we kind of hook into the KMM cache allocating system to get that, little, that information. But the, the, uh, regardless of the cache that it's in, it, it still gets that unique identifier based upon its allocation site information. Oh. Okay, cool. So then you're able to use the uh, the, the built-in return address to, to figure out the call site. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And, and I'll be honest, the, the tool needs, a, um, we need to do a little bit more like vetting on, because I know that there are a couple locations where the return address uh, call site is kind of encapsulated in a couple of layers. And I removed it for most of them, but I didn't know, I, 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 there's a couple of them that I need to make sure are all the way unwrapped, if you will. But that's the basic idea. Cool. All right. Any other uh, questions? Okay. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and probably zoom through some of this. Um, this is kind of the model. And the, so the most important piece with respect to understanding how this may be useful for landlock or security evaluation is that the operations occur within a context. And what we want to do is we want to use the ambient authority at the time of the operation to, to define principles. So effectively, a operations occur uh, within, within a spatial or a, a static authority of code location. And like I described about allocations. So we track allocation sites based, or you know, kind of the principle related to an allocation is, is the point where the allocation occurred. Um, another principle is the thread ID or the, the process. Um, I'm hoping to extend it easily to namespaces, but basically this is a, uh, a security context with multiple attributes. And each one of those kind of attributes is, is, a, is a vector of uh, different I, um, kind of principles that that attribute can take on. So, you know, thread, spatial location, and so forth. And that's, um, that's why I see this as being useful for kind of extensibility, we can add in these principles very easily and, and, and the, the information is all there right in line with the operations, which makes is it, which is how we basically track things. Um, okay, so this is not important. Um, so effectively, what, what, what we do is we, and this is what Memorizer creates, is a set of uh, maps, we, we, uh, I'm still coming up with a name, so uh, I, I'm not sure which is the best. I'm calling context aware provenance or privilege via memory access pattern maps. Um, I'm going to call them C maps for short, but basically they're like capabilities. They say this context has the right to invoke some operation, whether it's creating objects, freeing objects, modifying them, calling objects. Um, but basically it presents this map and we're going to go through a couple of maps here in just a moment. Um, okay. So memorizer really quickly. 
and I apologize the presentation I did not have a full one prepared uh, at the start so I'm providing a little bit of an integrated look here but um, so what is memorizer doing at a high level we take kernel source we pass it through an instrumentation both in automatic and a manual one uh, so we're effectively um, kind of piggybacking on kernel address sanitizer which uh, if you notice all the operations that we, we care to track are pretty pretty easy uh, low level so basically we need to hook all the allocations and um, the current tool I was hooking through Kassan and but I had a couple bugs so I basically hook created my own hooks just to see, just to make sure I had everything sanity checked um, and then we're using kernel address sanitizer to instrument loads and stores so that we can hook into all the uh, reason write operations and currently I do not have function tracing uh, set up. We've done a couple of explorations, but existing systems um, like ftrace and so forth don't uh, They don't track everything they overwrite themselves. so we have to a little bit more exploration there, but uh, so we basically instrument um, and then that instrumentation hooks into the memorizer kind of component uh, Which is doing object tracking. It's doing access recording. It um, also has a logging kind of interface and then it also does object lookup so it's got a, I, again, uh, Kassan basically has all of this stuff, but I had some bugs and I created my own kind of uh, subsystems. And so instead uh, I have this own, my own kind of object lookup uh, mechanism. And then there's a user space component, a little driver that we've got that uh, kind of will help benchmark and then uh, output the C maps for analysis. We've got a few analysis components right now, just uh, initial kind of empirical investigation of uh, what's going on inside the system. Uh, this doesn't really include any of those abstraction layers I was talking about getting towards SE Linux and so forth. Okay, um, so back to this. Um, I basically just described this. So status is that we've, we've got hooks in kmalloc and kmmcashallox. We have page alex are hooked, but there's a bug. So they're not enabled. I have not done per CPU hooking. Globals are hooked through Kassan. And, I, and then the stack is also hooked through Kassan, but I haven't gone through and really in detail, you know, viewed it, how it's working and so forth. Um, okay, so we're using Kassan. Okay, I already described this. Um, object lookup. So I built, basically built a hash table that's free table level lookup um, for tracking metadata. Um, so the idea is that, so go ahead and do demo. Um, so the idea is that you track objects and you, you keep a list of active objects. On lookups, you add some metadata to the object uh, about that's tracking the, the operation. And it'll be easier to just to, to show this information. Um, okay, so where are we at here? So on the right side here, I have a uh, memorizer uh, executing um, and just running in a simple Kimi virtual machine. And the, the tool is configured to enable object tracking at boot time. It does not do uh, access tracking because it's very slow. It will take forever to boot. And um, so we'll just kind of test it as we go. So the, the interface that's provided it is a simple um, debug of fest. So sys um, uh, interface, and it's got a couple of ways of controlling it. Um, so right now we've got, um, you can, we have the logs are in this map here, so we can cat sys kernel debug memorizer kmap. And what this is gonna do is gonna put it into temp So with this, uh, so basically the KMAP is an interface to print out the current um, set, of, set of data. And what this KMAP has been doing is it basically has been tracking object allocations. Okay. All right. It's going to get stuck. Nice. I apologize, I, I just, uh, the demo machine, I just changed some of the hypervisor stuff and so it made it a little, a little slower and maybe not so robust. 
<laughs> than I than I normally am. But so basically, this is going to create um, some uh, the basic K maps, and just to give you a view of what a K map looks like, uh, I've got some pre-recorded K maps here, or these are C maps. Sorry, like I said, the names of are still trying to figure out. Um, Okay, so what are we actually tracing? And how does this actually look? So what we're doing is um, each line that's unindented is an allocation. The allocation traces the allocation site. It, can everybody see this? Um, if I need to make it bigger, please let me know. I'll just go ahead and assume. Okay, so I'll just make it bigger just to, just to make sure. Um, so basically we track the allocation site, the size of the object, um, the location of the virtual address that's where it was allocated. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, the, the second element is the PID that was operating during the allocation. So it's a part of the context. Um, then we track the size, uh, allocation uh, jiffies for the allocation time, the free time, and the free location in the code. And then we also track the, um, the name of the user space executable that was in operation, or not the, user, the name of the, the process that was in operation when, the op when it occurred. And so what happens then is we, we create this entry and, and this is associated with some object. Now, what we can do is we could take this and then we use address to line and we can do a reverse lookup of the specific line of code in the source that was associated with this lookup or this operation. Um, so it gives us information about the kind of the spatial domain of the context that we're looking at. And, and, and then what else, and then, and then what it does, so this is the object allocation hooking. We create this entry and then and for every access we track the um, access location or access site, the access PID, and then we record the num number of re uh, number of number of writes and then the number of reads. So we can see that this particular object, um, for example, was was read. Uh, by the stack trace uh, dot C file uh, or written to, sorry, 13 times and it had a, a, several other reading, reading operations. So this is, this is kind of the really low level uh, data that we're getting out of Memorizer. And uh, Nathan, yeah. uh, question. Uh, I may have missed that from, from your description, but uh, how do you trace the accesses to the objects? Right now, we're hooking every uh, load and store operation. And we're using kernel address sanitizers infrastructure to do this. Is, is that done at the C compiler level, or is there some kind of source transform or macro or something that does that? It's the C compiler level. Got it. Thanks. Okay. It just inserts a little uh, hook point, um, I think, before every operation. And uh, is, so is, it, is this a GCC patch or something, or is there, is there some kind of a plugin mechanism for the compiler that lets us do this? It is a GCC patch. Um, uh, Kassan is already, it's already mainlined. So it's um, kernel address sanitizer already has all this infrastructure in there. It would be nice if they, I'm basically piggybacking their infrastructure. They could, you know, kind of make it uh, generalizable and then allow other types of instrumentation, but it is, it is uh, out there and accessible. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Thanks. Okay, um, so this is the low-level tool. Um, pop back up. Um, okay, so I just want to give a couple of, we've done some analysis just to give some intuition on what, what data we're seeing. Um, and this is really kind of very uh, initial exploration. So what we did is we drove, we drove Memorizer by running an SSH, just doing a simple SCP of some data, booting and tracking. And what we found is that if you group um, 
if you draw your boundaries based upon uh, C files, so basically if uh, uh, objects belong to the C files that allocated them, it turns out that um, a significant number of objects are, are only ever uh, accessed by the file that allocated them. So for example, um, uh, for writes, uh, with this particular test, 79% of the objects only were ever, 79% uh, of the accesses, sorry, were from within the same file. Um, and, and you can see that very quickly, most objects have a really nice locality property, meaning that this, this notion uh, of, uh, of behavior that, that is amenable to compartmentalization is actually a good, it's, it's, not a, it's not a poor hypothesis. Now, we need to extend the evaluation. This is kind of what I'm hoping to, to really drive the memorizer tool with Docker to, to really explore as many code paths and states as possible in the kernel. So this is very minimal, and that's one of the limitations of the current results is that we're seeing nice separation, um, but it's not clear. Now, I will uh, say well, well, there is one object. Here. Go ahead. Uh, let me just point out one thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that is that nine, uh, what, what you're seeing here is localization of the uninteresting objects. The interesting objects are the ones that, that you get accessed via a, a plethora of places. So why is that? Why is that one interesting? Uh, excuse me. I'm wondering why 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 those are interesting versus not. So, for example, your oh, crypto so, key. Okay, so so a good example here is data that's coming in off of a, a di off of a disk drive. Your disk driver is going to have all local data, almost all local data. Okay. okay, that's not actually from a security standpoint very interesting. What is interesting are things like inodes, where and inodes are are be being used in going to be used in many, many places. So you're much more likely to have a security issue with an inode than you are with a block that came off a disk drive. Okay, so can I, so I, let me, let me, I see what you're saying. So you have to understand that my context is not just speaking from a user -like perspective. I'm assuming an adversary that's in the kernel, right? So, so right. the security relevancy if, if something is in memory, it's accessible to a potential threat, which means that they can corrupt it. They can steal data. Yep. Um, so I, right. So I think that changes the, what you're saying. So I think I agree with you from the perspective of like an SD Linux policy. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. Um, I don't know. Is that... Yes, yes. The interesting objects are used in multiple places. Okay. And, and and maybe so 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 you're so you're hinting at a it's the converse of what I'm hoping that these results are demonstrating. So so what I need to do then it sounds like is kind of go through the sift through this data and and kind of devise a couple of kind of threats or attacks that demonstrate or just explore what's interesting from this, the attack perspective. That's right. Yeah. Be, because again, most of the data that's actually in the kernel is is completely uninteresting. Um, the fact that it's isolated into a particular yeah. code module is almost always a demonstration that from a security standpoint, it's not very interesting. It's that data then has to go someplace um, where it will be interesting and where it's con when it's contained in those other places that are shared, that's where you have, you have vulnerability. Yeah. So, so for example, like an SK, but like a, the socket buff. Right, the network buffer. That you get a packet in, and then that buffer is passed everywhere, right? Uh, yeah, it's passed everywhere, and it's it's manipulated by a whole lot of very interesting code. Yeah, so so so, so that actually hints at somewhat the, the expressibility of the model, in that so code code domains is one way of decomposing, and, and you're saying that you know, okay, so maybe localized means uninteresting security-wise, right? Okay, so that, that makes Tip it. Typically, yeah, tip. Um, yeah, another, another way of kind of decomposing could be based upon SK buff. So the context is, hey, I got a new packet in and I'm processing this packet. 
and I want to keep processing associated with this packet separate from processing associated with other packets. And that would basically traverse many code regions, components of the kernel, but it would provide a temporal isolation between instances of, and this is kind of what the namespace idea I have, uh, or what I'm hoping to kind of explore with namespaces. Would that be maybe a better context? Uh, to uh, the, per, to perhaps. Okay. The, okay, one, one thing to be, yeah. Yeah, and the networking code is a really good example because it's very, very intentionally um, written in layers. Okay. And so, so you you aren't going to have data that's isolated to layers. Um, it's going to go into. It's also going to go into your security module code as well, where you're going to have, have hooks to to deal with the security module specific behavior. Um, so it really does get. And parceled out among among a bunch of places, and then of course you have things like TCP accelerating hardware, um, that that will complicate things. So usually, the more interesting the data is from a security standpoint, the more places it's going to get it's going to get twiddled. Okay, so so, so okay, so this is great. Uh, I'm going to move on, but I think you're also highlighting a potential way of finding interesting data. Right. Part of this, this, my hope is that we can find fish where the fish are. Right. So, yes. so if, if, these, if these patterns are visible in a memorizer place, we can create an algorithm that says, Hey, what are, what are all the most interesting things organized from most to least? Like, for example, uh, which, which thing here has a thousand plus access seat? Any guesses? Past struck. Right. So clearly, um, that's a really important part uh, point of sharing that you need to think really hard about from a security perspective, right? That's so, right. So you're, you're, you're suggesting the, the inverse in terms of the, the way of looking at this graph, which is actually really interesting. So thank you for, thank you for that observation. I'll have to, this will be something to explore. Um, okay, so we're almost out of time. So let me uh, go ahead and... Um, okay, so we... Um, We've also created an interactive heat map. I just show this because this is a, a, a cool piece of data. It kind of shows um, allocation files are on the right and then accessors are on the bottom. And it kind of organizes and group things into bands of high access, um, which is kind of neat. You can see kind of natural kind of interaction domains and in particular objects. So it actually kind of gets your, the things that are highly accessible across many different domains would be things with uh, that have a lot of horizontal spread in this this plot um, so that's that let me go ahead and kind of close up with a set of questions um, uh, okay so demo results um, so the status of the tools that we've got call rat tracing um, we, we have a lot of optimization to do this is really a, a, an initial exploration into what's possible and um, we're getting nice initial data out I believe that this data could be used in mind for many different things. Um, but to get that more robust, we'll have to optimize, We've got some optimization tasks, um, and I have designs and plans for that. Um, there's a couple of like practical helps. Um, we're working on adding in, uh, I think really valuably would be adding in um, namespaces, uh, m really relevant to Docker, more so than maybe, you know, uh, process uh, contexts. Um, and then I had a couple of like uh, collaboration discussion points, basically extending memorizers for namespaces. Uh, I am planning to do working with Imani and Adam on uh, empirical and security investigation. So looking at Docker, using this data to kind of quantify in some sense uh, that ecosystem implication of Docker. Um, also look at, you know, how can these, this information lead into policy derivation for Landlock, SE Linux, or other tools of the like, um, and a couple other ones. So uh, that basically concludes, I know it was super fast and a lot of <clears throat> topics. Um, so please uh, feel free to ask any questions or, or uh, make any suggestions as you see relation here. Do you have an, like an example of a policy that you think could be derived with this? 
so so like taking your example of a task struct like the task struct is accessed a lot um but that i don't know how that helps me knowing that helps me write a policy you know what i mean well um so let's suppose so i i i'm not very familiar with docker um so I, I'm tr we'll try to get a good. Uh, it doesn't have to be Docker specific. I'm just yeah. like. So, so for example, let's suppose you have a crypto, the crypto module, right? And your keys are really, your private keys are really important and you don't want to leak your keys. So, so what you would hope to see is you would hope to see um, all the allocations, uh, all the key allocations. You would hope to see them only op, you know, modified locally by crypto files. So you would, but the idea is that you, you don't need to explicitly go in and label these things. You actually kind of, the, um, the map, so the, 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 the C map gives you a mandatory access control policy. So it says the only things I'm allowing are these. So for example, you could, um, like for keys, they would be maybe lo locally accessible. Maybe there's some other module that uses a key in one specific location, right? And so the map would basically show that and you could say, oh, this key was used in um, file x.c uh, in some other location and that's permissible operation. But everything else is denied. I envision that it would also, like I envision that namespace separation would be valuable. And, 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 and this is where I actually don't actually know how it, how it will look or what policies you'll be able to automatically see. Um, but for example, you could see that um, one namespace is modifying objects that were allocated by another namespace. And I don't know what objects are really important for namespaces, um, but basically it would show you sharing amongst kernel objects and namespaces indicating possible um, side channels for like, if you had like timing side channels or something like this. Um, and I currently uh, have it Basically, I've integrated it into Linux Kit. I have it building Memorizer and running it. Um, still testing to make sure I've got everything in, in order, though. So hopefully, it'll be ready for setting up a pull request soon. Nice. Thanks, Nathan. I think uh, for some of your points about uh, like investigating Docker and uh, again analysis there. We can follow up the two of us and other folks on this call. I think we'd be super interested in like this data looks really, really exciting. So uh, we can follow up directly on there. Um, and then I guess yeah, other practical help. Uh, data get CI. Just I think there are a few folks in this call who worked with data get CI, or we're just kind of curious what your what your thinking is there, or what you what you'd like to see, or what you think might be valuable. Just so we're on the same page. Yeah, so, so what I'm, so from, so what I feel like, I'm basically just hoping to turn on the tool, the, the tracing, and collect a lot of data. And just to have a rich data set to start kind of analyzing and thinking about policies and, and ways of grouping things. Um, that requires driving, driving the system effectively, so that you basically turn this on and then it operates in the background. And it's, uh, so basically I want, I'm hoping to um, get a lot of coverage, as much coverage as possible from kind of the, the, you know, standard Docker deployments or these types of things. And I think there's a lot of information out there. The CI piece was mostly um, focusing on um, my infrastructure and just developing a, a good um, workflow for all the processes. I'd like to, to kind of get the, hey, we made a change to something, make sure it, it builds and works. Um, but then also we've collected new data, run through a bunch of analysis tools that will automate kind of v visuals into the data. 
Yeah, that's cool. I think we can definitely follow up in the Linux kit Slack or uh, just directly, I think. Uh, be interesting to see how we can work together. So Excellent, excellent. Cool. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, thank you so much, Nathan. I think if for all these points we can follow up on the community Slack or the forum, that's the, the best place where most of us are accessible. Um, and would love to follow up with you. Again, thank you so much for the, the really nice presentation and demo. Uh, I think I have just one more slide just for next time. We don't even have to share the screen, but next time will be July 19th. We meet every two weeks. If you have any uh, feedback or any topics that you think we should explore, uh, I might actually send out a poll to the group at some point about next uh, meeting topics, uh, we can go from there. Uh, then as always, if you have any feedback, uh, it's all open on the Linux Kit repo on GitHub, so please feel free to open a PR or just reach out directly to me at riazadoctor.com. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thanks Nathan again for the presentation, that was awesome. And we'll see you next time. Yep. Thanks guys, see you. Thanks. How's it going? Thanks for the opportunity, Riaz. Appreciate it. Thanks for presenting. It was awesome. Good, good.